Well, hello, WordCamp Europe 2016. Um, thanks for the intro, Frankie. I am indeed David Lockie, Director at Pragmatic. We are indeed a specialist WordPress agency based in the UK, um, formerly a proud part of Europe. Um, today I want to talk to you about discovery and definition. Our mission at Pragmatic is to create success with WordPress. And a prerequisite for creating success is to remove pain from a project process. And we've all been there. Anyone that's been involved with a digital project or WordPress project has had that, that moment, that kind of sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach, where you realize that you've missed a requirement or you've made an assumption and you're going to have to work all night, probably not make any money, or anger your client, and maybe even all three. Um, which is obviously a painful process all round. So we found that this discovery and definition technique has been invaluable in helping us avoid that pain. Um, and I want to run through it with you today. So a project often starts like this, a simple inquiry, can you build a website? And as an agency, we'll rapidly try to qualify that lead out. The two most important questions being, how much money have you got and when do you want it done by? Um, and if we're lucky, the client will have an answer and be forthcoming about it. And in this case, OK, it's a decent budget. Yeah, everyone needs a website next week or next month or maybe even tomorrow. And they've got some thoughts about what they want, so they're going to send the brief over. So there's a fit, top line. We're looking through the brief and we think, OK, so they want like a WooCommerce shop and they want it to do this and that and the other. And we're going to start overlaying our approach, our expertise, our understanding on top of the client brief to come up with our own vision of what this project's all about and what's going to make it a success. The client, however, probably has their own ideas. So they're going to be taking inspiration from their experience with websites that they use every day. They may well not be technically savvy, so they might not know that that just doesn't make any logical sense. You can't just make this thing do that without years of underlying data. Um, and their expectations of what's in a project are going to be limited to, generally, they're going to be limited to what is the end result. So it's a website that looks great and does all these things. As an agency, we're looking at that project budget and we're going, okay, so this is planning, this is creative, this is production, this is testing, handover, QA, pre go live checks, go live, all that kind of stuff. So we've got to spread that money a lot more thinly than a client might realize. And so often we end up here. <laughs> Anyone that runs an agency, this has to be one of their favorite uh, internet memes of all time. And so this is the riskiest part of this whole enterprise. Do we say no? Because we don't really understand enough. It feels like it could be pretty risky, high expectations, quick turnaround time. <laughs> and therefore miss out on like a great client relationship? Do we force the client to go to a lesser WordPress agency and get the work done? Or do we go, yeah, let's do this. Let's make it work. We're pretty sure that we can merge these two things into something that's going to be good at the end. Um, but we've all seen what happens when projects do go ahead at this stage, right? You end up with a site that looks great but just doesn't work, or the other way around, it's really functional but it looks like a dog's dinner. Um, or our personal favorite, we've had this website built by another agency and it's nearly finished. Can you just do these last few things? And that's, you know, that's the result of a poor planning process, right? Is you kind of hit these things and maybe the agency bows out and they think, you know what, that is 10 grand more work. I've got five grand of budget of invoice that I'm not going to get out, but I'm okay with that. I'd rather just not get paid and walk away. And so how do we solve for this problem? It's not, as you might think, a job of making that budget realize that brief. Neither is it a question of squashing the client's dreams and making their brief fit into the budget that they have. Actually, it's a more interesting process than that. It's understanding why they've written that brief and why they've chosen that budget and what they actually want to achieve. And there's no way that you can do, like, progress against this problem without understanding that from a kind of a fundamental level. So 
most often in this case, will start with like the first part of the project, and it's not going to be like, okay, it's, it's the cat and the child. It's going to be you know, something that's slightly different, so maybe the cat and the tiger. But then the client's ultimate vision of this like, kid with a tiger on a boat in the ocean, actually it's going to evolve because they're going to end up with a lion and a girl in the jungle on a rock, and the lion's eating like a gazelle leg or something, because a digital project is as much about organizational change and learning as it is about just whacking a bunch of code together. And so whatever a client thinks that they want digitally in two years' time is probably wrong, you know, well-intentioned, well-meaning, but wrong if they're going to learn what the website is teaching them. So they're kind of false goals, both of them. And so here we are in this weirdish wild space between sales and production. How do we take this lead and turn it into a great project that's got every chance of a successful outcome? And that's what this talk is about, discovering definition. And that's the process by which we align vision, requirements, expectations between the client and the agency so that we all understand what the project is, what the process is, what the outcomes are, and that, that we've factored the success in from the beginning. This is what it looks like. It's pretty straightforward. Um, discovery, that's stuff that we do together. Definition tends to be a phase of work that we do separately. And playback is where we come back together after definition's complete. And what I'm going to do is dive into each of these sections, into each of the activities, and try and break down what they mean, because the, otherwise it's a bunch of words. So discovery starts with pre-discovery. We move on to like, typically a workshop setting where we're going to meet stakeholders, we're going to run through a whole bunch of Q&A, and we're going to use that opportunity to challenge some of the answers they give us and share some of the expertise that we have from building hundreds of projects. Um, so pre-discovery is you know, set up all of your internal processes, work out which team or which developer, which project manager is going to be the best fit for delivering it, who's got capacity. Um, make sure that you've planned all of these bits of work in so that once you kick off the process, then you can finish it quite quickly as well. Um, you need to have a look at the brief that you've been sent over or the brief that you've written down from your initial calls with the client and then take all those answers and put them into your own project plan, your own project documentation so that when you're working on, your team's working on lots of projects, they always find the same answers to the same questions in the same place. And, and the different project plans. So then we can go into a workshop, like a discovery kickoff meeting is usually what we call it, um, looking like we've done our homework rather than turning up with the same blank template that we always use. So we use like a Google Doc, uh, it's just a sheet, and it's a really quick and easy way of everyone to collaborate, chuck a whole bunch of answers in in a, in a structured way. Um, it's essential that we have everyone that's a key stakeholder in the room, so that's project manager, team leader, lead developer from your side, and it's the decision maker, the budget holder, the business owner, whoever is going to have ultimate kind of say over the project from the client side. Otherwise, you're going to risk having to redo this, or they're going to come in later in the process and take away an assumption, and suddenly everything, everything breaks. It's really important to understand that people communicate in different ways. So like me, I'm a, I'm a talker, as you can probably tell. Uh, it's amazing how many people don't actually understand what you're saying, they just nod and agree. So use different techniques, draw uh, wireframes up on a big piece of paper. It's amazing how, like, how far apart your assumption of where the client is with you on that journey can be. Another really good exercise is um, like a retrospective. So I don't know if you've ever come across this, it's like a, an agile technique. So particularly where there's an existing site or an, an, and you're doing like a rebuild or an extension piece on there, it's really worth taking time to find out what people got glad, sad and mad about their existing site because those are all the kind of the learnings that help shed light on why you're doing this project. And it's really important to capture that and go forward so that you can tell them at the other end of the project, look, you know, here, now you've got an effective content management system and the site loads in less than 30 seconds. So during this interview, we're going to be looking to answer a whole bunch of questions and answers, everything from like, what, 
what do you want your business to be like in five years, or who are your target customers, right down to where's your domain name registered, do you need an SSL certificate? Um, really very wide scope. I mean, I think we have like 150 questions that we run through. So it, it is a lot, and it needs like a, a process to run through and do that. And it, the next bit about challenging assumptions is, I, I'd say it's more of an art than a science, because you don't necessarily know which answers you're going to get that make you think, do you really need multilingual? Or are you just saying that because you think your competitors are doing, you think it's important? So just experience will do that. Just like listen to what your client's saying and stack it up against what they say that they want this project to do. So once we've done all that, we've essentially drained all of the client's ideas and visions and expectations out of the project, then it's time to move on to definitions. So uh, typically, both parties will have a bunch of actions out of the end of discovery. So like, find out who's got the Google anal an Analytics logins, or we need to go away and um, do a bunch of stuff before we can complete this process. And definition really looks like that, finishing that process and then recompiling all those answers into something that um, is a brief. So research is understanding what the heck you're doing, and don't vouch for the fact that your client has done this. Um, understand who their clients are, who their competitors are. You know, if you're really going to create success, then you need to understand the competitive landscape that the website is entering, what's the business purpose. And there's a bunch of techniques that you can do there. Um, I won't drill down too much into. Then you need to de-risk what's left. So once you've gone away and you've um, put a WordPress site together with a default theme and a bunch of plugins and tested whether this all like hangs together, you know, can you complete all these things? Um, you need to work out what's not been done. You know, where where does the risk, the technical risk, remain in the project? So it could be like an integration or a component or an interface that doesn't exist, or the one on Code Canyon looks like ropier than usual. You know, what what are you probably going to have to build out custom? And what's involved with that? Make sure you really zoom in and understand that piece of work, because that's probably the bit that's going to come back and bite you. At a top level of trying to help a customer, like a client, understand what their website's going to look like, a site map's pretty fundamental. Um, and user journey and mapping, and user journey uh, mapping and wireframes both complement that. So if you've got a sitemap, like, why do those pages live there? Because this user's journey says that they need to check out the T's and C's, or um, you need a confirmation page because that's where people get after they've made a payment. So cross-checking all these different things, like if a user needs to go from a home page to a news page to a news that sign up confirmation page, do those pages exist in the wireframe? And do the things that you're asking people to do exist on those pages? Um, it's a lot to hold in your head, basically, and then that's a lot to communicate out. So write it down. Also, make sure that you finish your tech spec. So answer any lines that remain TBC or I don't know, or I'll get back to you on that, and just make sure that it's as complete as you can possibly make it, um, because this is your, this is really your risk mitigation as the person that's got to build this. You know, if you don't capture the fact that this is only going to be browser. Uh, compatible, cross-browser compatible for browsers that are two years old or, or newer. If you don't have that in there, then somebody's bound to come along and make you make it IE 7 compatible or something like that. So just think of all the things that clients could ask you that would change the project. Make sure you've got a backstop answer for it. And once you've done all that, then you can get back in the room with the client and discuss what this project actually is. So you can do these things. We can have a look at the wireframes. Um, here. <laughs> Sorry? Sure. The slides will be available online later as well. So here we've taken wireframes and we've assembled them into like a UX specification. So it's not just here's the wireframe. It's this is the wireframe for the home page on this device. And 
these are the key messages and these are the things that we're asking people to do and those are annotated because if you give somebody a wireframe, they'll still see two different things. You know, one person will think, well, that's at the top, that must be the most important. The other person will think, that's got the button, that must be the most important. So document this stuff out and it will actually help form a basis for kind of continuous improvement later on. So it's a way of documenting all of the knowledge you have about the site even before you start building it. You can also assemble all your wireframes into um, like either just like printed this, then this, then this kind of user journeys. Or even better, you can upload your wireframes into a tool like Envision, make them clickable, and that kind of natural way of navigating, you know, what do people see when they land on this page on a mobile device? You know, what happens when they click this thing there? That usually like it's it's worthwhile. It's a bit of a process, but it throws up some interesting stuff that you don't want to get to by the time you're presenting your kind of you know, your actual built website. Um, it's pretty likely that the nice green project plan that I showed earlier on is going to have some lines which remain TBC. You know, they're answers that we can't get out of the client in time or like we just both jointly don't know until we get a little bit further down the line. You know, we've done some of this custom development. And it's really important to talk about those. So here are like to every single project ever risks, you know, the client's going to miss their deadlines. What does that mean? And it's not the case that if they miss their deadline by two minutes, uh, two days, then you'll push the project back by two days because that's not the way that we work, right? We have capacity and it's resource for different projects at different times. So it could be like, actually, it's two weeks. So you need to talk about what that impact is because the client will have their own imagination about it. Similarly, what happens if they ask for something that's out of scope? How do you handle that? Do you just say no? Do you do a change order? Do you whack it into the next sprint? How's that way, way of working actually play out? And finally, and probably most importantly for you as, a, as an agency or as a freelancer, is a brief and a proposal that actually makes sense. They are de-risked. We've got a UX spec, we've got a tech spec, we've got a risk register, we've got a cost, we've got a plan of when all this is going to be done and when the feedback rounds are due and what happens if they miss those. And that's your, that's your main commercial document for the, the rest of the project, all the creative, all the production, all the testing, all the handover, all the go live, all the subsequent services. Now you've got a chance to understand what they are. That's, that's your, you know, that's the magic. So, if I was in the audience three years ago, I'd have been thinking, there is no way in hell I am doing all this work for free before I even start getting paid for a project. And it's, you know, that's true. There are really hard deliverables out of a discovery and definition process, and you should be charging for this time and money. So the client's getting a UX spec and a tech spec and uh, a project plan and a proper brief. These are all valuable commercial things. They might not have thought about them before they started a website project. It doesn't change the fact that they need them and that they should pay for them. And there are other benefits as well. So this is perhaps one of the most important things you can do with a client is to understand their business, what's driving them, what they hope to achieve, why, you know, is this their family income, is it like a side project, all that stuff. It's like it matters. And so having that understanding, having that trust and developing those ways of working, like does this client never answer an email? Are they better on the phone? Do they change their mind? Should you have like a Slack channel to back up all the other things? Do they just want everything with a ticket number and an email sent back to them? Everyone's different. And until you have been working with the client for a while, you don't realize what those subtleties are. And actually, in the thick of a project where you're all committed to this thing, that's the wrong time to work out how best to work together. And so after all this, we're asking people to sign off on you know, some money to do a project. And does discovery and definition guarantee they're going to sign it? No. Actually, quite a good outcome of discovery and definition is sometimes they can't go, you know what, maybe I should get this creative brand book done before I start the website, or maybe we should do this technical integration piece, or we should get this person in, like a, we should get a project manager or a head of digital because this is like, this is an important piece of work. So that's fine. Actually, like not embarking on a project that's doomed to fail is a pretty good outcome. Um, what I will say is, if they do sign on the dotted line and you do get a chance to run at the project, the chances of successful, profitable outcomes are 
much, much higher. Like we've had so few projects fail once we've been through a rigorous D&D process. Like all these questions, all those 150 questions, either you ask them at the start and you get paid for it, or you ask, they can't ask you them at the end and you have to write, roll over and do them. You know, it's very difficult to bypass all of that understanding and knowledge. So yeah, the pain is at the end if you haven't asked them. So I know I don't have long left, but charge for this. It's not a freebie. It's some of the most valuable work you can do as a professional. Bring cake, keep people's blood sugar up. This is, you know, they're big meetings. They're, some of them will be like existentially challenged by some of the questions that you ask. You know, like what are your, what's your three year plan for the website? You know, they just might not know. So make sure everyone's really comfortable. Um, remember that they're humans and that you're spending a bunch of time with them in a room. So be a bit softer about it. Critically, cover all those questions. If you find yourself going too deep into one specific question, put a flag in it and come back to it later on. Because the most important thing is that you understand like, where the gaps are by the end of things. So then you can come back and understand what work needs to be done to fill that in. If you only get halfway through, then like, you're imagining what, what lies beyond. It's really difficult to then plan the rest of the discovery and definition process around that. And of course, tailor this whole process to the project size. You know, if we're doing a four-day off-the-shelf theme, smash it out in a couple of weeks kind of job, we don't do all this stuff. But the fundamentals of what we need to do are in there. So we always ask those questions. The wireframes, the UX, all that stuff might be just a theme demo. You know, it's not a wireframe, it's not a clickable prototype, it's there. You know, your text here, your image there, your logo there. So there's shortcuts, and you do need to adjust all these different activities, but even for a very small project, you need to put a significant amount of time of that into discovery, definition, playback, planning, because otherwise it will, it will hit the other end of the project and cause everyone pain. So that's me. Thank you for listening. I hope it's uh, been interesting. I'm very happy to...